For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. Hello and welcome to Stat News Global. I'm Surya Gagadran and you're watching Borderline She. Our uh, China series looking at uh, the decade-long period beginning 2013 when India-China relations have been going south. And as you're aware, this roughly coincides with Xi Jinping's rise to power. I have with me two China scholars, uh, Amit Kumar of the Takshashila Institution uh, and uh, Suyash Desai, uh, a China scholar again at the Sun Yat-sen National University in Taiwan. Welcome to you both. Uh, let's get on to th uh, threat perceptions. I have a small map here for you. Uh, as you're aware, India has two threat perceptions, one from China on the east and the north, and Pakistan on the west. Uh, similarly for China, uh, they also have two threat perceptions. One is obviously on Taiwan, another is, of course, India. Now, we're going to explore this further. Uh, let me begin with uh, Amit Kumar. Uh, Amit, uh, you've written about this uh, uh, threat perception of China, the two-front theory. Uh, could you just explain uh, uh, what this is about? Yeah, sure. So, as you rightly pointed out, uh, when we talk of a two-front problem, we think of India's two-front situation, where we have the, our two adversaries, uh, Pakistan and China. But what often skips our attention is that China too faces the two-front situation. And this is the issue that uh, I have dealt with in my paper titled China's Two Front Order. The, uh, the two fronts that China faces are the Pacific Front and the Himalayan Front, as I call it uh, in my paper. On the Pacific Front, it is challenged by the US and its allies that together form the three island chain of uh, defense, uh, defenses. And uh, as M. Taylor Fab uh, has described, for the Chinese, uh, this front has been their primary direction. Uh, that poses a strategic threat. And of course, a lot of it has to do with uh, the status of Taiwan uh, and China's reunification dream. Uh, the second front of the Himalayan front is the one that it shares uh, with India. But uh, before I move forward, I think it's necessary to make a verification. Uh, that is, uh, where I, uh, when I refer to a two front conundrum, uh, it does not necessarily mean the possibility of a two front war. As I look at it, uh, I would describe it as a three level problem. Two-front situation being the first, two-front merger, and nasty two-front war. A two-front situation is, is a scenario basically where you have two distinct uh, active fronts uh, that are that are guarded by uh, two distinct uh, individual uh, adversary. Two-front merger is a situation where there begins to emerge a strategic convergence uh, between the two adversaries, but does not necessarily mean uh, that any one of them will uh, fight the other's war. Lastly. Two front war is where uh, the two adversaries coordinate uh, war efforts against the common enemy. But even if the possibility or the likelihood uh, of a two front war for either China or India can be dismissed at this point, the very fact that they both face a two front situation or a possibility of a two front merger is a security concern because it would naturally restrict uh, your capability to fight at one front with optimum capacity uh, because you have to cater for any exigency that might arise on the other front uh, as there happens to be a convergence uh, of interest among your two adversary. And so it diverts your, uh, and limits your resources. And this is true for both India and China. Anyway, coming back to the point, uh, uh, beginning 2008, uh, China's insecurity regarding a two-front situation and its merger started to resurface uh, because of two reasons. And that this is what I talk about uh, in my paper. One, the growing convergence between the U.S., and India on security and defense issues, uh, which is primarily founded on their shared apprehension of China's rights after the end of the Cold War and the dawn of the 21st century, uh, there was a strategic shift in the U.S.'s approach, uh, and India emerged at its, uh, as its uh, key defense and security partner. And this partnership was aimed at countering and balancing uh, China's rights, even though it is uh, not openly stated. Uh, this has got Beijing and Xi Jinping wide. The second factor that I talk about was India's reversal of its decade-old policy towards uh, 
border infrastructure, border frontiers. Mm -hmm. Beginning 2008, uh, we witnessed a massive push to upgrade our border infrastructure along the LSE, which sought to negate the tactical advantages that the PLA had vis-a-vis -vis India, going to its superior infrastructure uh, on their side of the LSE. China's tactical uh, advantages vis-a-vis -vis India were a deterrence that Beijing wished to maintain. But appending this existing equilibrium in consonance with uh, the deepening strategic convergence uh, with the US over China, uh, threatened to not just revive uh, the true front challenge for China, but also the credibility of that threat. Now, incidentally, 2008 is also the year following which, uh, roughly is uh, the period uh, following which we begin to witness a sustained rise in PLA aggression uh, along the LSE. Uh, Chinese violations along the India-China border have proportionately increased with uh, China's rising threat perception of a true front challenge. And uh, this is what I find in my paper. And uh, uh, and the numbers rose from around uh, 150 in 2007 to 270 in 2008 to an average of more than 400 incidents uh, of transgressions uh, in the past decade. So uh, my paper attempts to contextualize China's aggression uh, along the LSE in the past decade uh, or so against uh, the rising insecurity within China with regard to what war from Canada. Okay. Amit, uh, you mentioned, um, um, you know, I'd like to talk about one issue. The fact that China has perhaps been, although it faces a two-front uh, scenario, um, it has been able to leverage that, would you say, far more imaginatively than India has? Uh, yeah, and uh, this is what, uh, this is uh, something I talk about in my paper also. And I suspect, uh, and, and you're right, and I suspect it is uh, because the lessons uh, that they have drawn uh, uh, from the similar situation they faced uh, decades ago. So interestingly, China faced a similar situation of a two front challenge from India and the US uh, between the 1950s and uh, the late 1960s. Uh, and uh, it, it drew, for, uh, it drew uh, anxious of uh, developing a two front uh, threat in the early 1950s. The Communist Party of China feared a US mad uh, Taiwanese invasion from the east. On its western front, uh, uh, along the Himalayas, uh, China was wary of uh, India's interference in Tibet and accused it of colluding with uh, the U.S. to instigate uh, secessionist uh, tendencies during uh, the 1950s and early 1960s. Now, the threat of two-front war might not be there, but two-front situation persisted, as I uh, uh, mentioned my clarification. So, this vulnerability uh, was also acknowledged, uh, in, in fact, uh, by Kwan Sui, uh, uh, then Chinese ambassador to India in his demarche uh, of 16th May 1959 to the Indian, uh, then Indian Foreign Secretary. And uh, when he wrote uh, that uh, the enemy of the Chinese people lies in the East. And he said uh, that China would be so foolish to antagonize uh, the US uh, in the East and again to antagonize uh, India in the West. And therefore he sounded a warning and he said uh, that India too faces a two-front situation. And that is something that what we are also facing. And uh, to somewhere uh, our meeting point lies. So, indeed, from the perspective of facing a total situation in 1959, it was also a veiled threat to India. So, uh, Amit, I just, just like to stop you there. Amit, I just like to stop you there. Uh, do you believe that in the yeah. current situation, yeah. China has leveraged its position on this two front thing better than India has? Because India appears nervous, you know. Yeah. We keep talking about it, we are concerned. How has China done this? Have they done it better? Yes, exactly. So, uh, drawing from that experience that in during the 1950s and 60s, so India's response, uh, so when China started uh, in that period also, if you see, China was quite aggressive along the LSE. And India's position uh, was uh, that rather a defensive one. And uh, after this threat, when, which, went un, uh, which went ignored in India, uh, we see that the, the LSE became volatile and uh, that period was the most volatile and bloodiest uh, uh, phase of the India-China relations when it comes to uh, the border relations. So, uh, I think India's timid response to these incidents uh, and uh, there, there were two violent inc incidents in 1959, Longju and Paupala, where India, India lost uh, uh, some of their soldiers. And uh, India's approach was definitely defensive and I think, therefore, I think... Uh, and uh, even uh, Nehru assured the U.S. president then after the war 
that India would not take any action to provoke China. And uh, Lieutenant General Panath, uh, in fact, wrote uh, that uh, the debacle of uh, that uh, war was such that the Indian uh, political leadership did not uh, dare to deploy our army on the LAC for the next 24 years, a complete break away from the audacious uh, forward, forward policy. So I think the Chinese drew a lesson uh, uh, that it can exploit India's insecurity about facing a two-front challenge to outsource its own two-front conundrum to the latter. And this is what we are witnessing even now. The means have, of course, uh, changed, I think, post-1967, barring one incident in 1975. Uh, the PNA uh, has refrained from resorting to uh, uh, violence uh, along the LSE until the Galwan. That, too, was an anomaly in my opinion. Uh, and, but they have instead resorted to a limited and controlled confrontation, followed by a protracted stalemate, backed by an extended uh, negotiation as a strategy. And this pattern is fairly visible in on the conflicts uh, since Depsan 2013. Okay, thanks. Uh, um, Suresh, I'd like to come to you. Um, you're based in Taiwan. What is your reading of this uh, two-front uh, scenario? First of all, thank you so much for having me. I would like to congratulate Amit for his paper. It's a very well-researched paper. Uh, I have a stride three day on military on the two-front scenario. Uh, I completely agree with Amit when he says that it is a long process. It has been happy since 1950s. Just that uh, I completely did. Generally, China in the BLA uh, defines uh, military strategic direction. These are uh, these are periodically revised, but the military strategic direction that is the primary threat that China has since 1993 is Taiwan. Uh, before 1993, their military strategic different uh, directions were fluctuating between USSR, then USSR, and then uh, US. Mm -hmm. But uh, since but since 1993, it's Taiwan. Uh, um, now, now that we know that Taiwan is the primary strategic direction, they have something called as competing consideration. Uh, it can be in the form of color revolution. It can be in the form of uh, people within the party revolving, uh, rebelling against the chair. Uh, these are domestic consideration. Uh, the second one is the regional, which includes India, Japan, China. These are the uh, regional consideration. And third one is international which is uh, it's securing SLOC, uh, US interference, etc. So all of this together, China puts it into one bracket called as its second front, third front, fourth front. Its understanding in its doctrinal text, its understanding of two front warriors, uh, whenever uh, Taiwan contingency is taking place, or, or after my minute, whenever Taiwan contingency is taking place, if a second front opens, it can be in the form of the problem, uh, inspired by quote the oh, United States, it by quote oh, the United That country taking advantage of domestic, of the second, of the primary consideration. For example, if Taiwan happens and India chooses to take advantage, this is what China sees. Or South China Sea goes into flare when Taiwan happens. Or, or US does something on the slock. Uh, for example, uh, the choke point. These all are developed into its second friend. Include in like uh, this is uh, China's, uh, China's doctrinal understanding of two-front wars. Uh, now, uh, uh, they are definitely worried about two-front war because all of they are talking about it, it since a lot of time. It's a literature, even if you just see all the, uh, the science of military strategies, uh, all the second artillery campaign strategies, China has repeatedly yeah, mentioned mean. this. Uh, that, that there are two front wars and the first the two front war is when china do does something in case of taiwan in country takes takes opportunity when china engaged on the on its east that's the finish uh so it has been repeatedly talking about it and uh india does figure into it and india's uh so india yeah. prime uh when 1993 the doctrine was written china's primary strategic direction was taiwan and its technical yeah, strategic direction fluctuated in South China Sea and India. But, uh, and this is just my assumption, right? How I have, don't have solid evidence behind this, but my assumption, we didn't find the next slide. They have elevated India from second, second, two and a half stripe prime strategic direction, one and a half strategic direction, especially after the war, uh, because of things that are happening. Right? That is, uh, uh, that in the way that they are uh, posturing on the Western. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so Shri, uh, Shri Ash, let me just stop you there. Yeah. So, Sri Ash, 
How does that, uh, given that India has now been elevated in the priority ranking of the PLA, how does that determine how the PLA prepares for, uh, say, some uh, conflict uh, with India? How does that, uh, you know, uh, decide uh, what what kind of resources the PLA will deploy? I think, I think, sir, the resources are not determined by the alertness. Because uh, since three form and before that, the military regions, when military regions were formed, uh, there was a separate allocation for resources based on threats and the kind of threats that are reported. I'll give you an example. For example, uh, uh, when there are certain kind of re for example, LBDs, LHDs, these are used for landing operations. They are allocated to East. But uh, E-15 tanks, which are the lightest tank that now has, was first when it was commissioned was first allocated to Western Theater Command, especially South Xinjiang region where all the act action is happening right now. So the resources mm -hmm. are not determined mostly by transactions, but determined by long term contingencies and uh, the location nature of the structure, uh, etc. So these things are determined. But I'll tell you what determines this are uh, military exercises can show us uh, the kind of military exercises that are happening. Uh, in the perfect act, it is reflective of what kind has happened or what kind of uh, threat per street is. For example, if you go back in mm -hmm. 10 15 years, uh, the kind of military exercises that were happening uh, in Tibet, in Tinchin, are very different from the kind of military exercises that are happening uh, in Xinjiang and Tibet. Right? The, 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 the exercises right now are integrated joint operations. Uh, it can be sure something. But the level of military exercises, the frequency of military exercises, the nature of military exercises and the forces that are engaged in the military exercises are very different from what it was 10, 15 years ago. In Western Theater Command, uh, Tibet military history, okay. in Chang. That is an indicator that okay. something has changed in the last few years. Okay. Uh, Amit, I'd like to come to you. Um, how would you do, you, uh, you would have monitored the uh, recent round of air and naval exercises that China held around Taiwan. Uh, this is around the time when uh, Taiwan's president was in the U.S. Uh, how would you describe the scale, intensity of those exercises compared to, say, three years ago, four years ago? Uh, certainly, uh, uh, the intensity, I mean, uh, ever since uh, the Xi Jinping uh, came back up, uh, uh, to lead uh, the party for the second time, the intensity has increased. I would say uh, he has made it his. Uh, 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 he has in, uh, he, he wants uh, to leave a legacy behind, wherein he wants to reunite uh, Taiwan with China, and that forms a uh, uh, because without reunification, the national uh, rejuvenation would not be possible. But uh, yeah, certainly China has been uh, much more assertive in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, and if you compare it uh, with India, certainly it has been much more assertive in the uh, in, in the Taiwanese Strait. And uh, China considers that this it uh, it is uh, something uh, Taiwan as its uh, or unification with Taiwan as one of its uh, core national interests and a red line that should not be crossed. And uh, therefore, we see the Chinese leadership often threaten to use force uh, against uh, Taiwan. Uh, and uh, but uh, th this is interesting. Uh, 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 I would say uh, observation that I I was able to make, uh, and it was uh, while the Chinese leadership has often threatened to use force uh, on the Taiwanese front, it has been more cautious uh, in using force uh, and escalation against the Indian soldiers or on all the LSE. Uh, I mean, it wants escalation, but at its own uh, terms that it didn't it get controlled. Uh, three examples before us are uh, Galwan, Kailash Range, and Yangtze. Uh, East time when yeah. India has respected. Uh, and try to escalate the situation. Uh, the Chinese have shown a great sense of urgency and eagerness to diffuse the situation. It happened in Galwan, mm. and also when India India's came the Kailash Range, uh, and recently in Yangtze. It seems that the PLA is prepared for military posturing along the LSE, but not active conflicts. Uh, but this is in stark contrast, and here, here, it, uh, here it becomes interesting. This is in, in, in stark contrast to the position that they take on uh, Taiwan. They are prepared to use force. They constantly threaten use of force. Uh, they scramble jets and uh, even uh, uh, warships uh, uh, along the uh, across the strait, uh, and uh, and they threaten that they uh, they are prepared to use force if pushed. 
But unlike India, uh, at the unlike at the Indian front, uh, where they ha the PLA has been challenged uh, by the Indian Army, uh, the PLA hasn't been tested so far in the Pacific. So it mm -hmm. it's kind of difficult to put a weight on their claims and threats. Uh, but analyzing their pure rhetoric, uh, it seems that China is prepared to use uh, all the force that it has to uh, retake Taiwan. Yeah, I mean, very interesting. Uh, Suresh, I'd like to come to you. Uh, there is a view in Taiwan that um, rather than the Chinese uh, mounting an invasion of the island, it is more likely that they will focus their energies on India, where the Himalayan frontiers presents its own, you know, remoteness from uh, external, uh, you know, interest. And therefore, it is more likely they will turn on India rather than uh, Taiwan. Um, I think, I think uh, there's a very minority view about this. Uh, because the Chinese doctrine itself is that Taiwan is their prior strategic direction. Uh, forget about let's forget about the doctrine for a second. If you just observe the kind of exercises or the kind of weapons that are being coming, always see they didn't hear about that. Everything first is implemented with the Eastern Theatre Command, and then it goes to Western Theatre Commands. I'll give you an example. Mm. In 2020, uh, uh, PLA, uh, so the Chinese uh, CMC rolled out something called as Integrated Joint Operations. This is a new form of joint air drive. Integrated Joint Operations is for more services would uh, function at the same time in an, uh, uh, in an, integ in an uh, local regional conflict. Uh, so this was post the instant joint operations where uh, practices drills were just the first time that drills took place in Eastern Theater Command. Uh, these drills are also starting to happen on the Western Theater Command. And recently, there are mm. uh, Air Force and uh, PLA ground forces practicing together in Japan. Every it has first in the Eastern Theater Command. Uh, weapons, better quality as the ugly duppy because it receives everything the last, last uh, military mm. strict to modernize was Shikcha. So I admit that Taiwan is the, uh, their right, strategic direction. Uh, are coercing both. They are coercing India, they are coercing Taiwan. India is a big force. They know that if something happens on the India front, uh, it will be a status quo for a very long time. But in case of Taiwan, if US doesn't head Taiwan, it's an easy win for them. That's why everything happens first in Taiwan and Taiwan is the biggest uh, biggest problem that they have. And followed by India. But I will not put the uh, importance of Indian conflict, especially after 2020. Because even if you see in their discussions, in their debates, in the papers, in the Chinese newspapers, uh, the value or the discussion on India has increased tremendous. So mm -hmm. that also says that they are elevating, that what helps with Indian dispute has elevated. So Suyash, um, what explains uh, Chinese foreign policy? And this, we are trying to uh, understand this. Uh, Chinese foreign policy appears to be intent on opening up as many fronts as possible, whether with the US or Japan or uh, you know, with India, with Taiwan, I mean, they've opened up multiple fronts. What is the logic here? That I think, I think uh, 2020 was an anomaly. 2020 when one happened. 2020 is when South China Sea dispute increased. So there was a lot of in South China. And Mike Pompeo made that statement. And uh, as he approached to South China Sea change. So 2020 was when all fronts when, were on a uh, boiler. The 2020 was an aberration. Mm. But generally, I would say China, uh, China, China, like any country, China is a rational actor. But in India, if we are about uh, two front wars, similarly, China also is worried about two front war and it is repeatedly seeing through its right. That is why when China was formed, there were 24 disputes, including territorial and land disputes. And right now, they only have six disputes, two land two with India, one in four territorial disputes around the uh, East. So, uh, there, there is a logic and that is why you see whenever something has to happen in Taiwan or in the East China Sea, uh, there are immediate uh, setting down of things on the Indian border or huh. uh, settling down of things on the South China Sea. If you would see, uh, in the past two years, except the uh, aberration uh, in 2020, South China Sea is relatively stable because Taiwan is up, ADIZ is happy. So they are controlling, uh, they are also very, uh, at least on uh, the reporting that they get, uh, there are uh, internal disturbances on economy, but not internal disturbances in Xinjiang and Tibet. So that is why they, they only 
about they make sure that when one border is open or something happens on one front and that's the taken care of except for 2020 experience when it was expedition when all of them uh, all of the front went on we still need to understand why it happened maybe covid that was an aberration when all the friends went on but, but otherwise generally when something happens or something has to happen not in our front and generally at that period of time for that day nothing happens on taiwan or nothing happens in pacific because you cannot because uh, it's like the major uh, major learning from the russian ukraine war is extended line of logistics which china china mm. is also observed and if you see this yeah. bit between east to west and central theater command the logistics are very extended and china is worried about that limited resources yeah, mm-hmm. both fronts uh, have problem then what would be the result how would both fronts uh, coordinate because in chinese talk understanding uh, first the border units are activated then the pla from that theater command is activated and then, then the theater command is supported by uh, central theater command so right now mm-hmm. cautionary measure china is also trying to uh, uh, support stuff uh, uh, dedicate some parts of certain theater command to india in case of this two front cutting which we were the fight over i find indian sea then western theater command tibet military district uh, xinjiang military district they would be dedicated to uh, which has very similar conditions like they are also dedicated to india so these are some things that they are thinking when two fronts have was eastern theater command and central theater command will be busy in taiwan if such thing happens I think. yeah yeah mm-hmm. so they are also trying to so will be work out this yes so uh, last word from each of you uh, this is about how much of the up and downs that we have seen in india china relations is driven by the persona of xi jinping amit you first there there has been there has been an assessment uh, uh, there has been line of thought that uh, does say that xi jinping is uh, actually the person driving uh, uh, all these uh, the multiple fronts have opened up and uh, xi jinping's personality has a lot to do with it uh, there is some some credibility to that uh, uh, thought uh, i mean uh, xi jinping does pride himself as uh, the savior which is uh, which has uh, which the history has uh, uh, ch- chosen uh, to fulfill the china the, the chinese dream of uh, uh the chinese dream of uh, national rejuvenation and uh, and he has taken upon himself uh, and he has extended his uh, tenure beyond 10 uh, 10 years and uh, he thinks that he's the one who can actually uh, uh resolve uh, the contradictions that emerge in uh, the, that have emerged in the new era so yeah there this there's, there's some truth to it but uh, i don't i don't think we should uh, completely uh, uh get behind this uh, because it uh, it uh, runs a risk of ignoring other strategic reasons that might explain uh, his actions or other action or other reasons that uh, might uh, offer uh, useful explanations so yeah there's there's some credibility but uh, yeah we need to uh, we need to, we need uh, to not do not uh, uh, need to shut down uh, 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 ways uh, and uh, the reasons that might be there in uh, open uh, to explain uh, yeah fair enough so suyesh same question to you how much of what we are seeing in the ups and downs of india china relations is driven by the persona of xi jinping um i i i, I don't think it is driven by the persona of xi jinping per se you can say that about taiwan per se because uh, taiwan as uh, she has taken it up on her said that it is his dream as amit right to this union reunification should be achieved that he is he wants to uh, invite his name into history but uh, if you see india uh, since 2004 2005 china has been thinking about india since 2008 china border policy it also includes tangent security policy has changed and the repercussions of it has been uh, have uh, been visible since 2030 when that step sang happened then chumar happened then doklam happened then dalwan happened and uh, slowly and steadily this has increased uh this is a type of coercion that china is trying to do uh based in coercion where uh it keeps india on the burner all the time uh this coercion will keep on increasing also one reason because both the sides uh, there are many reasons but one important reason because india has also improved its uh improved its uh, order infrastructure especially in the last 7 8 years and because we don't have a proper structure of how to what things uh how to resolve the border banks we have a lot bigger uh green line lcs 
problem within problem. Why does I'm not going to define? So if uh, people keep on running into each other, I don't think it is India problem. Is she specific? She specific. Taiwan problem is definitely she specific because she wants mm-hmm. reunification to happen in this time. But India problem is more structural, which has started due to the change of Chinese foreign policy since 2007, and as a result, escalation has started since 2000, uh, 2013, 2014. Uh, but there is one catch here: uh, India has always been coerced by China, but this time India started responding. Wake mm-hmm. up situation for in, uh, China, which was also reflected in its uh, in many writings from KMS. KMS is my academy of military sciences. Uh, where major uh, writing happens in China, PLA writings happen. Uh, so this was reflected in after Dogla when India went somewhat this is territory to protect Bhutan's territory to protect. But Dogla was a very major uh, wake up call followed by Garwan, which resulted into increasing of importance of India into this. Mm-hmm. So, but again now because of many factors which I have already mentioned, improving border this like knowing border connectivity, improving weapons. Uh, this is going to stay constant. It is going to coerce India more and more. So on the Indian side, I would define this as a coercion, long-term coercion, which will happen again and again. And on the east with Taiwan, there is a major threat that some action could possibly this. I would not discount 2027. 2027 is when PLA is turning accurate worse. 2025 yeah, yeah. is when PLA is mechanized. Uh, so these are two important days regarding Taiwan. But on India, low level of coercion will continue to happen. Even uh, for makes sense. So it is not season. Mm-hmm. It's a structural problem. So interesting perspective from both of you, uh, Amit Kumar, uh, Suyesh Desai. Thank you for appearing on Borderline. She lots to discuss, but frankly, so little time. Thank you very much for appearing on Borderline. She and for those of you who appeared on the show who um, joined us on this uh, conversation, thank you. Uh, do subscribe to our YouTube channel and look forward to more such series uh, coming forward. Thank you and good night.